Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this edition of Theology Talks. We're talking about theology and also thinking about how theology applies to our lives. Uh, today we're going to have our second episode on the subject of creation and the age of the earth. In the first episode, we, we talked about a young earth and heard some details of, of how one might hold that position. Uh, and today we're going to look at, at a, an old earth position. My name is Matthew Winslow. I teach systematic theology and church history here at the East Asia School of Theology, and I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Loke from, from Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, so happy to have you here, uh, Andrew. And maybe could you, as we start off here, could you just maybe give us a little introduction? Uh, tell us a little about yourself. How'd you come to faith? How did you come to be interested in this topic of, of evolution and, and the Bible? Um, yeah. I grew up in a Christian family in Singapore. Uh, so go to church since I was young, but I didn't treat my faith seriously uh, until I was about 16 years old. So th that was when I started to think about the big questions of life, right? What's the meaning of life? Um, is that the end? As I reflect on my life, I, I found that uh, without Christ, it seems very empty. And in the meantime, I have good Christian friends around me you know, who uh, are living a very de devoted life to Christ and filled by the Holy Spirit. And so I was very inspired by them to look deeper into the Christian faith. And so um, after I'd done that for a while, I uh, began to um, realize that I need to commit my life to Christ. And so that was when uh, I was born again. Um, and since then, I've been serving in church uh, actively. And then later on, um, because I did quite well for my studies, I went on to do medicine right, at NUS. Uh, when I was in medical school, I tried to talk to my friends about the Christian faith, and we talked a lot about science and Christianity. And so um, th that was what made, started my interest in uh, this topic. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually didn't know that you studied medicine, so you, you've uh, multidisciplinary in your, your approach here. That's great. Um, as we talk, I, I want to ask you some questions uh, about this, this topic of, of science and the Bible and, and creation. Um, as we begin, I thought I would just read a passage of scripture uh, real quickly here. And so I, I have uh, here Isaiah uh, chapter 40, uh, verses 25 and 26. Uh, here the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, speaking the word of the Lord, he says this, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. And, you know, you, you look at the Bible, and throughout the Bible, uh, we're reminded uh, that, that one of the evidences for God's might and God's power is that he created all things. And so I, I think it's, it's fascinating uh, to be able to look at creation uh, and to think about this topic of, of creation and the, the age of the earth and how did God create all things uh, and, and what can we learn from that. Um, so as we begin, uh, maybe can you just give us a little overview? Uh, how do you understand creation, the age of the earth, um, give us a, a brief overview of, of your view. Alright, to understand the Bible properly, we need to follow proper hermeneutical principles. Right? So we need to interpret the Bible um, in accordance with our understanding of its genre, uh, the context um, of each sentences, um, and also to understand the meaning of the words in the original language, and also the um, uh, grammar and the historical background of the biblical authors. And so these are important principles that we need to follow in order to interpret any text properly. Right? And so um, when we apply these principles to uh, studying Genesis chapter 1, for example, we realize that the main message is very clear. The main message of Genesis is to tell us that uh, there is a God who created the universe. Um, and we have good scientific evidence for that too. Right? So uh, we can talk about that, the cosmological arguments, um, the fine-tuning argument, theological argument, so the, those are good evidence and reasons for thinking that there is a God who created the universe, and this relates to the passage that you read early on, right? that God is awesome, right? he's the creator of all things. And God not, not only created the universe, he also created yeah. living beings, he also created human beings, and human beings are created in his, were created in his image. And this creator, he also created a yeah. habitat that was suitable for uh, human beings, right? the Garden of Eden. So he set up a cosmic temple within six durations of time. And it stopped on the seventh duration. And so this set up a pattern for the human work week. 
right? That uh, you know, we work for six days, rest on the seventh day. Right? So, so that's the pattern that was set up in, in Genesis. Uh, and so that, that would be the main message of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now concerning the details, right? say for example, exactly how long each of the six durations was, different biblical scholars have different views. And my own view is that I have not seen any good reason, uh, biblically or theologically, to hold to young earth creationism. Um, because there are other biblical scholars who hold to other, uh, other interpretations right, of how long each of the, of the six durations was. Um, now, by the way, I also do not think that the Bible teaches old earth as well, right? So, um, and that's why I'm wearing this shirt, <laughs> this colored shirt, right? Because uh, um, I, I'm neither, uh, uh, theologically, I'm, I'm, I, I don't support young earth, but neither do I support old earth. Uh, because I don't think the Bible teaches old earth either. Um, but however, I do think that there is good scientific evidence for old earth. Now we can talk about that later. Um, but the most important point I want to emphasize today is that since the young earth creationists claim that the Bible teaches young earth, the burden of proof will be on them to rule out the alternative interpretations um, which other biblical scholars have offered. Okay, so um, now in, in my publications, I have discussed some of these alternative interpretation. So one of them, for example, is um, the interpretation suggested by Old Testament scholar uh, John Collins. Now, I encourage uh, the audience to take a look at his book, Reading Genesis Well, for the details of um, his interpretation. Uh, but here, I can give a broad summary. So one, one important point that Collins pointed out is that the six days can be understood as analogical for six durations of time, which means that they might not correspond exactly to a 24-hour period. Okay. Now, in support for this, in support of of this interpretation, Collins notes that day seven, uh, which is um, mentioned in Genesis chapter two, verse one to three. So day seven of the work week has no ending. The lack of an ending is indicated by the lack of a concluding formula. Uh, you know, it doesn't mention that there was evening, there was morning, right? There's no mention of this uh, for day seven. Now this formula, so this formula, there was evening, there was morning was used for the first six days. And it is used in that way to indicate a completion of the duration, right? Evening and morning indicates light and darkness. You know, this indicates the completion of the full day. And so the lack of this formula for day seven indicates that day seven has not concluded, right? That it, you know, it's not completed yet. And so this indicates that uh, day, seven actually, day seven actually continues, yes. And in fact, um, yeah. okay. sc scholars long time ago, way before the rise of modern science, have already recognize this. Uh, so John Collins mentioned Aristobulus in the second century BC. You know, he has already uh, understood that uh, this Sabbath is still continuing. And so this in in indicates that the seventh day um, is analogous to a duration that is more than 24 hours. It continues. And therefore, uh, so since that is the case, I think each of the first six days could likewise have been analogous for a duration that is more than 24 hours as well. And so as John Collins say, the presentation here and also elsewhere, you know, say for example in Exodus chapter 20 verse 11, um, it says that you know, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth. Right? Now this is a passage that is uh, one of the favorite verse of the young of creationists. Right? They often mention Genesis, Exodus chapter 20 verse 11. Now Collins say yeah. that that yeah, that verse can also be analogical as well because it talks about the six days, right? But how do you understand the six days? Well, as I said earlier on, the six days could be analogical for a longer duration of time, just as the seven day is analogical for a longer duration of time. And so Collins think that God's work and rest are like human uh, rest and work in some ways, but unlike it in other ways. Um, so, which means that, no, they are not exactly the same, right? It's analogical, as he says. And therefore, um, these creation days are God's work days. And since they do not correspond, and since the divine Sabbath does not correspond in length and character to a human Sabbath, we need not concern ourselves with the exact relationship of this work week and the human work week. So what this means is that uh, even, the word, even though the word yom uh, is understood as a 24-hour day, right? it means a 24-hour day, but it could be analogous right, to a, for a longer duration of time. And so Collins' interpretation doesn't change the meaning of the word, right? He doesn't deny that the word yom 
um, does mean a 24-hour day in this context. But what he's saying is that this word can be analogous right, to a longer duration of time. Okay, and be because you know, the, the seventh day right, is analogous for a longer duration of time. And so, um, yeah, so, so that is uh, Collins' interpretation. Now, there is also another point uh, which uh, is important to note, which is that um, the, even, even if each of the days is not analogous for a longer period of time, right? so even if you know, we follow the young creationists to think that every day is 24 hour days and that, that's it, it's not analogous for a longer period of time, still it doesn't imply that the whole of creation only began to exist uh, within those um, six 24 hour days. Why? Because we need to know that the ancient Jews, they were actually more concerned about function and phenomenology rather than ontology. And therefore, as John Walton argues, um, we can think of creation in those six days as functional creation. So what that means is that during those six days, God could have organized um, the, um, the, 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 the situation on earth in such a way that a, a habitat is formed within the localized place. Um, it's somewhere in the Middle East to form the Garden of Eden, to set up a place which looks like a cosmic temple right, for the first humans to dwell in. And so from that perspective, you know, God um, formed, right, that, that, that set up that place in that sense uh, during those six days. But it doesn't mean that um, the sun or the moon only began to exist in those six days. They could have existed for billions of years before, right? The, the Bible doesn't say that, but the Bible doesn't exclude that either. Um, and then it's only within those six 24-hour days that you know, God shaped the world in a phenomenological way um, uh, and so, so that... Um, the, the sun, the moon, they can exercise their function of marking out the times and seasons as Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 says. And again, now this is not a new interpretation. This is a, a very uh, tradi old traditional interpretation as well. So for example, if you look at the, the writings of Oregon, right? Uh, Oregon in the 3rd century, he discussed the question, how come the first three days have no sun? Right? How come the sun only appears on day four? Right? So this is a question that a lot of people have asked as well. Right? How come the sun only begins on day four? Uh, whereas the earth already existed before that, it seems. So a lot of people thought, think that no, this is um, yeah. contrary to modern science. Well, actually, Oregon, even before the rise of modern science, Oregon already you know, discussed this. And Oregon says that, well, um, we, we shouldn't think of the sun as beginning to exist only on day four. But rather, this is the language of appearance, he says. Right? This is phenomenological language. Perhaps we can think of it this way, because when we uh, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, initially, it, the surface of the earth was dark. Right? There was you no... Know, um, it was without form and void. Well, now, if you look at other passages in the Bible, yeah. in, in Job, for example, um, it says that, uh, Job 38, verse 9, it says that God um, make it, uh, God created, uh, God make the clouds its garment and wrap it in thick darkness. So what this means is that you know, there, could be, there could have been some cloud or mist that was covering the surface, uh, the, the surface of the earth. That's why you know, the, the, the light from the sun it cannot come through, right? Because it, it appears that it was dark. And so uh, there could be an opaque yeah. primordial atmosphere, uh, which during the, the, and then uh, during the, the first few days, you, 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 the, the first day, the, the light comes in, right? And then by the, fourth, by the fourth day, right, the sun, the moon, the stars can be seen clearly, right? And so, uh, so, th so this is a function, phenomenological interpretation, uh, the, the language of appearance, as uh, Oregon puts it. So it doesn't mean that the sun only begins to exist on day four, right? But rather, it's the sun being able to be seen clearly and to, uh, you know, to have the function of marking days and seasons from the perspective from the Earth's surface looking up, right? So this is setting up the cosmic temple. Yeah. And so uh, we can say that by day four, you know, yeah. the whatever op opaque mist right, has been sufficiently cleared such that from the frame of reference of the Earth's surface, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, which could have existed before then, would have been visible enough to serve as functionaries for time measurement. Okay, so this is a functional phenomenological okay. interpretation, and I think that makes sense as well. So from the, so, and so yeah. uh, what this interpretation implies is that uh, we, you know, we, we shouldn't assume that the whole universe and the stars and galaxies only begin to exist within those uh, six 24-hour periods. Right. So in summary, um, no, I, when, we, when we look at the Bible, we need to interpret it carefully, right? We need to interpret it according to the genre, the, the context, the meaning of the words, the historical background. And I've offered two interpretations. Uh, one is by John Collins, the other is by John Walton. Yeah. And both of them 
interpret the Bible according to these principles I mentioned, right? So John Collins you know, interpreted uh, it in context, you know, taking into account day seven, for example, noting that it has no ending and indicating therefore that uh, day seven could be analogous for a longer duration of time, which implies that the first six days could, each of the days could also be analogous for a longer period of time as well, right? So that's uh, uh, John Collins interpretation. And then John Walton's interpretation is also based on proper hermeneutical principles, right? He argue based on understanding the Jewish uh, background and also the meaning of the word, yeah. words for create right, in, in the Old Testament, like bara, as, asa, no, these words can, can mean functional creation. And so uh, both interpretations are based on proper hermeneutical principles and both yeah. are defensible. And if the young creationists were to insist that, um, oh, you know, God says that everything began in 624 days, then the burden of proof will be on them right, to exclude these two interpretations, but they have failed to do that. And therefore, I don't think that there's any good reason to hold to young of creationism. Okay. Yeah, so I, I appreciate your, your summary there. So, I, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is the, the point of Genesis 1 and 2, uh, in, in your view, is, is not to tell us exactly how old the earth is. Uh, and in fact, there, there are a few different ways we could interpret that. Um, and I appreciate, I mean, so I, I think we could agree that throughout the history of the church, most people have thought it was 24-hour days. Um, however, have you, as you pointed out, uh, there, ha there have been some. I mean, it certainly hasn't been unanimous. So Origen, I mean, we, we could bring up Augustine. Yeah. We could bring up many others uh, throughout the history of the church who, who have suggested that um, perhaps it could be interpreted differently. Um, and, and of course, today, you know, Jack Collins and others uh, would say perhaps it's, it's, it should be interpreted differently. Um, OK. But, so I, I appreciate that. That's, that's a, good, a good summary uh, and, and helpful to think through as we read through Genesis of um, does this text demand that it's uh, six 24-hour days or, or are there other ways of interpreting this? Um, tell us a little bit. So you, you talked about um, you know, when, when you're in med school and, and talking with your classmates that a big issue was, was science and how does science come into faith. Um, I mean, how did you wrestle with that to begin with? Um, I mean, what role does science have in, in our faith or in our understanding of the Bible? Um, and, and we can maybe talk about Genesis specifically, but, but just briefly, what would you say about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, the first important thing I want to highlight is that we should not use modern science to interpret the Bible. Okay. Uh, that would be wrong. Right? It'll, be, it'll be ICGCs, right? Okay. You'll be reading modern science back into the Bible, right? And so methodologically, uh, it, 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 it's, it's wrong. Uh, right. Uh, rather, so, so, uh, and so uh, that would be the error of concordism, right? So, uh, and so we, we, should, we should reject that. So we should not use modern science to interpret the Bible. Rather, we should interpret the Bible according to proper hermeneutical principles, mm -hmm. as I mentioned just now. Those principles, such as consider the genre, context, historical background, etc., word meaning, etc., right? And so, uh, as, and also explained just now that Collins' interpretation and Walton's interpretation are based on these principles. They are, it's not based on modern science, okay? Um, so, so we shouldn't use modern science to interpret the Bible. But however, yeah. I, I do think that if we interpret the Bible properly, according to those proper hermeneutical principles, and if we do science properly and interpret the scientific data properly, these two, the results of these two should be consistent. Why? Because God has revealed himself through creation. And we call this general revelation, right? And God has also revealed himself in history through the inspiration of scripture and through the incarnation. And therefore, uh, and, so, um, and therefore, if we interpret Bible properly and interpret science properly, they should be consistent. Okay? So I don't use modern science to interpret Bible, but I do use modern science to interpret reality. Okay. Okay. So uh, to interpret the real world, right? So for example, we are having an online meeting now. Okay. How, how does it work? How, how is it physically possible? Well, we can, we can interpret our experience right now using science, right? using physics. Uh, we can understand it. You know, we can understand quantum physics. We can understand computer science, and that's what makes it possible for us to have an online meeting now. So I do use science to interpret reality. I'm sure all of us, all of us do, right? Now, does the Bible talks about computer science? Does the Bible talk about computer science? No, obviously not. Right? The Bible doesn't talk about computer science. The Bible doesn't talk about quantum physics. The Bible doesn't talk. But the Bible doesn't talk about DNA. Okay, so the Bible doesn't talk about computer science. But is the Bible in conflict with computer science? Well, no. Right? Because the Bible doesn't exclude the possibility that one day people can build computers, right? So, so, so the Bible doesn't talk about computer science, but the Bible is also not in conflict with computer science. 
so they are so what we read in the bible is complementary with what we study in science right they are, they are not contradictory but they are complementary um and so uh, and so i already explained how how is it that uh, yeah. when we read the bible properly right it, it doesn't exclude an old earth okay but and when we study science um when we study science we find that okay. there is plenty of evidence for old earth actually um so the evidence for old earth um and old universe right is a okay. uh, comes from multiple scientific disciplines cosmology geology biology uh, chemistry and so it's, it's a, a range of disciplines all yielding results that point to yes. the same conclusion which is that the earth and the universe is very old billions of years old right uh, so for example in cosmology uh, we have yeah. um, the evidence from the starlight from distant galaxies which will take billions of years to reach the earth and there's also evidence from the age of the stars and the black holes yeah. for example which will take billions of years to form right. and also um, when we look at uh, geology right the, the, how the layers of um, the volcanoes and coral reefs how these are formed it also takes a long time and in, that, and in addition to that we also have dating of samples uh, not only from the earth but also from the moon uh, from meteors that come from outer space uh, this has been dated and using different uh, a range of dating methods so it's not just carbon dating right but scientists use actually at least 40 different types of um, physical elements right so, say for example uranium lead for example um, and so and so uh, no, all these different dating methods no they all you similar conclusion right um, indicates that it was billions of years and so so it's not just one form of evidence but there's a range of evidence uh, which needs to be explained right so so if the young of creationists reject um, the old earth view scientifically they will no they, they will need to explain how how it, no, what what explains all this range of data from different disciplines that all point to the same conclusion right and there is no good way that, that they can explain this away this convergence of, of, of data okay. now what we do find in the young earth uh, view yeah. is that you know, they, yeah. they sometimes try to explain some away some of these things uh, um, um, but what they end up talking about is actually pseudoscience. Right? So, for example, uh, there is there is a, a video which I watched. Actually, it, it was from the interview that you did with a young creationist uh, a while ago, right? And, and he he tried to explain um, away the evidence for uh, the dating of dinosaurs that indicated dinosaurs was millions of years ago, and by by claiming that um, by saying that well, scientists have discovered uh, soft tissues right, in in dinosaurs, and he he, he thinks that you no know, that. Uh, rebuts uh, the, uh, the the evidence or, or indicate the unreliability of, of, of the dating for dinosaurs bones but actually that uh, is based on a misconception a, a misunderstanding right um, yeah. yeah so yeah Andrew let me just ask the question just yeah no so you know uh, because that, that is that is an issue that young earth creationists bring up is yeah the, this mm. discovery of soft tissue in dinosaur bones um, and so, you know, how would you respond to that? The young Earth creationists would say, uh, well, this is evidence that dinosaurs are actually much younger, uh, were created much more recently than traditionally said. I mean, how would you yeah. respond to that? Briefly? So, uh, actually, many scientists have already responded to that. Okay. Yeah, so here I'm sharing an article yes. yep. which is published uh, in, a, in a journal, The American Biology Teacher. It's a peer-reviewed uh, academic uh, journal yeah. article. And in this article, it discussed the issue about preservation of soft tissues in the dinosaur fossils. Okay, and here I just, now because we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I just want to read some parts of it. Right? So for example, the abstract, it says here that, um, now the evidence from radiometric dating shows that dinosaur fossils are indeed millions of years old. And as I said just now, it's not just, it's not just based on carbon, right? It's based on a range of dating methods. Mm. And under, under certain, certain circumstances, cells and soft tissues in bone are protected from complete disintegration. Formation of a mineral concretion around a bone protects biomolecules inside it from hydrolysis by groundwater. Infusion and coating with iron and iron compounds at a critical point in the decay process protects cells within a bone from autolysis. Cross-linking and association with bone mineral surfaces furnish added protection to collagen fibers in the bone. These protective factors can account in soft tissue preservations that last billions of years. So there are multiple plausible naturalistic natural explanations for why you can find those you can find those soft tissues 
uh, in, in the bone, right? So, uh, and 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 so that that would be um, the response that yeah. many scientists you know, have given. And in the rest of this paper, uh, you can read how carefully scientists do science, right? So, um, you know, they consider various possibilities and they yeah. uh, take into account different various results to uh, to to rule out those possibilities and to talk about how these different mechanisms are possible uh, to preserve the soft tissues and. Uh, so they cite many studies that indicate this, and then later in the later part of this article, it points out the young Earth creationist distortions. <laughs> you can see right on the screen how how the young Earth creationists you know they have distorted what scientists have said. Yep. You know, take their statements out of context. And by the way, Mar Mary Schweitzer, the, the the woman who was interviewed, right, that uh, the, the young creationist says she was doing good science. Uh, yes, she was doing good science, and she doesn't agree right. with the young creationists actually. Right, so uh, she, in fact, she has she and others have published papers that explain how right. is it that you know the the, the soft tissues can be preserved, right? So right. and um, and so uh, the young creationists have tried to respond to them, but you know, their response are based on a bad reading of those um, papers, as this article points out. That young creationists also mentioned the evidence from radiocarbon dating, okay. right? Carbon fourteen, right? He says, well, carbon fourteen has also been found, right, in uh, this uh, no, no, this uh, this uh, dinosaur's bones, right? Now again, that, that is also uh, based on uh, right. fallacious inference. Uh, so let me let me quote another article which I want to share here. Okay, so this article, another article yes. um, that talks about uh, scientific article talks about radiocarbon in dinosaur fossils. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. The radio and so yep. again, yep. let me just take a look. Let's yep. just highlight the abstract. Okay, so it explains here that fossil bones incorporates new radiocarbon by means of recrystallization and in some cases, bacterial activity and uranium decay. Because of this, bone mineral, fossil or otherwise, is a material that cannot yield an ac ac accurate radiocarbon date except under extraordinary circumstance. And mesionic, mesionic bone consistently yields a falsely young radiocarbon date of a few thousand years to a few tens of thousands of years, despite the fact that it is millions of years old, as established by other evidence. Right. Okay, so so in this uh, abstract, it explains how, how is it possible that you know, we, we can find the, the radiocarbon in, in the bones because, as, as, as again, right, there are other possible explanations. Um, and it, it is not due to impurities, right? So just now, if you watch the video clip, right, the video clip that we played just now, the, the younger creationist whom you interviewed, right, says that, well, uh, they, are, they could be in, uh, uh, the old earth thing that they could be due to impurities, but those have been ruled out by careful experiments. He he claims, well, that's that's a misrepresentation of science. Right? That's you no know, the, the scientists right who uh, do this. They they you no know, they is they didn't just appeal to impurities or what right? They were talking about how radiocarbon can be incorporated by recrystallization. Right? This is a you no, know, and and this has not been ruled out. Right? And so th there's this, and there are also other possible explanations. And in the rest of this paper, you can see how scientists, again, how carefully they do their science based on multiple data. And, and so which indicate that the young creationist response is, um, right. you know, it is wrong again, right? Now, um, so, and, and, and this is not the only problem. I mean, there, there are also other things that the young creationist mentioned as well in, in the interview that he did review, right? He also talked about other um, so-called evidence for young earth. Uh, Say for example the, the population growth and all this, but those have also right. all of them have also been refuted by, by scientists actually, and no, so we don't have time to talk about them. But uh, yeah, I just yeah. Uh, like to let, let you and the audience know that uh, scientists do their science carefully, right? They have already excluded those other um, uh, arguments, objections that the young creationists have put forward. Can I jump in? I I, I just want to ask the the question. So um, yeah, so. This is helpful too, just just to know and and to to point out that that certainly scientists have come up with good reasons for why they believe soft tissue was preserved inside of bones, um, and and Schweitzer and others have have done that thoroughly. Um, I think how young Earth creationists might respond is is they would say, well, a lot of modern science is based on the assumption of of naturalistic mechanisms uh, operating in the same way that they do now. Uh, over millions of years, um, and they would say that maybe a better explanation of some of these things um, is that a supernatural or, or a divine explanation uh, might be a better one, but that's outside of the bounds of, of modern science. How would you respond to that? No, I have a few points in response. So the first point in response is that, uh, you know, young creationists often distinguish between what they call creation, his historical science with experimental science. 
they say that uh, historical science is about the past and we cannot observe the past, right? Um, however, this is, a, again, another false reasoning. Uh, is Why? Because we also cannot observe the future. Now, can you observe what is going to happen one minute later? You can't, right? Um, so does it mean that, uh, therefore, you will jump down from 10 stories one minute later? <laughs> now, of course, you won't. Why? Because you know that if you were to jump down from 10 stories one minute later, you know that you'll probably die because of gravity, right? If you jump up to 10 stories, you'll probably die. And so what this means is that you know that, and I do as well, and the young creationists also know that the laws of nature would probably hold one minute later, even though we cannot observe the future, right? But we know that they will probably hold. And so if that's the case, then why not for the past? Okay, so the young creationist is being inconsistent here, right? Now, um, does it mean that, uh, and, and so we have good reasons, right, to believe in the laws of nature, that to assume that they will hold, right, for the future and for the past. Yeah. And this, this is reasonable, why? Right? Because the, our, our understanding of laws of nature is based on numerous scientific observation of the world, right, and which help us to understand how the world would behave when it is left on its own, right? So that, and so for example, when it's left on its own, right, gravity works, right, when it is, um, uh, left on its own, you know, uh, radioactive decays happens, right? A starlight from distant galaxies would, would need a long time to reach the Earth. So that's how scientists can calculate that the world and the universe is very old. Now, does this exclude the possibility of miracle? No. Why? Because God can intervene if he wants. And uh, when God intervenes, then the world is not left on its own, right? But God doesn't, but God doesn't uh, just intervene anyhow, right? So, um, when we, so when we read the Bible, when we see that uh, when when does God do miracles? Now God doesn't do miracles all the time, right? But rather God do does, uh, does do miracles only on you know, some very special occasions for special purpose. You now say for example the resurrection of Jesus, right? Uh, God resurrect Jesus um, to uh, as a as a vindication of Jesus' claims for, about himself. So God vindicated Jesus' claims by raising him from the dead. And when God does miracles, he also leaves behind evidence, right? So we know that there's evidence of empty tomb and there were many people who saw Jesus alive. And that's how people can know that Jesus resurrected. And this is a miracle that happened. God doesn't mislead people, right? God doesn't do miracles in such a way to give people a false impression of what happened, right? To mislead people to think otherwise, right? Now, the young creationists, what they are arguing is that, okay, okay. if they want to use miracle, to explain away all this plenty, plenty of evidence for old earth, then what they are saying is that actually God did miracle in such a way to mislead people, right? To mislead people into thinking that there is an old, old earth when in fact the earth is not old, right? In that case, it will be a God of deception, right? It will not be a God of truth. And that will be contrary right, to our fundamental Christian conviction that God is not a, a liar, right? But God is a God of truth who has revealed the truth about himself in creation and also in scripture. And therefore, I, I find the young creationist uh, objection to be untenable and you know, is, uh, is philosophically untenable uh, and also theologically problematic as well. I'm compelled by what you're saying in terms of the science and, and that the science, um, you know, there's very good reasons uh, from multiple disciplines for seeing the world as, as being old, much older than a few thousand years. Uh, so I, I find that compelling. Uh, however, you know, it's often pointed out that if the world is old, uh, maybe that brings some problems with how we understand scripture. Um, and so we, we don't have time to dive into these. Um, but just very briefly, you know, people bring up maybe two big problems with that. One would be death before Adam. Um, and so if the world is old, would you say that there was death before Adam? And if so, is that in accordance with scripture or how do you understand um, yeah, the curses in, in Genesis and, and, and Romans 5? Yeah, this places? is a big topic and I, I, I know we will need uh, maybe... Yeah, yeah, so I, yeah. I'm putting you on the spot yeah. here, but maybe if you can explain it in like, or you could just give a summary, yeah, a right. summary in, in uh, a couple I, I, minutes. No, I have given other talks <laughs> elsewhere and these yeah. are on YouTube right, where I should address this question over one or two hours, right? Uh, so I would encourage yeah. the audience to take a look at those other resources and also check out my book. Uh, so I have written two books on this topic. One is called The Origin of Humanity yeah. and Evolution, Science and Scripture in Conversation, published by TNT Clark. And I've also written another book called Evil, Sin and Christian Theism, where I address the problem of evil, about suffering, uh, including suffering before Adam, 
uh, and that book is published by Rodledge. So I would encourage the audience to check out these resources for a detailed explanation, right? Um, yeah. So, but to put it very briefly, what I want to say is that, um, now, first of all, the young earth creationist assumption that there is no death before the fall is based on, again, uh, er erroneous or problematic in interpretation of the Bible. So let me give one example. Um, you, you'll hear that young creationists often argue that after God created, he says that it was very good, right? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God says that it is very good. And therefore, the young creationists think that very good means no death, no suffering before that. However, when we look at the Hebrew words for very good, you know, in the Hebrew is toet meut. Now, these same Hebrew words are also used in other passages in the Bible, say, for example, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 7, where it refers to the land of Palestine, the promised land for the Jews. Now, the land is very good, right? It's the land of milk and honey. But does it mean that it is perfect? Mm -hmm. No. Because why we know that mm -hmm. that land is filled with enemies of the Jews, they are filled with, they are, the land is filled with wicked people, and there is also death of animals, death of plants, death of human beings in that promised land too, right? So, therefore, Toad may good, very good. Very good doesn't mean no death. Very good doesn't mean no suffering. What very good means is that it is fit for God's purposes, right? So, um, so we must, we must be very careful when we interpret the Bible because I think the young Christian is, is reading a lot of assumptions right, in, into the text. And so, um, and another good example would be Romans chapter 5, verse 12. You know, the young Christian is often say that, well, death comes by sin, right? So Adam's sin, that is when death started. But again, no, they are not reading the Bible properly, right? Because if you look at Romans chapter 5, if you look at the context, right, it is talking about human beings, right? Human sin which brings about human death and suffering. Now, it is not excluding the possibility of animals' death right before uh, human sin. Now, there's also a lot of other passages which we can talk about, but uh, I don't know okay. whether we have time. So, just to summarize, I, I think what, what you're saying is that there could have been animal death, but the, maybe there's something unique about human death and how human death uh, is related to, to sin. Is that is that the summary? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Am so, I correct? Yeah, that's right. When we read the Bible, for example, in Psalm 104, no, Psalm 104, verse 21 to 24, it says that uh, it talks about the li young lions roaring after their prey, right? The young lions, the, the lions are carnivores, right? They eat meat, which means that there is already animal death. Uh, and, and the Bible says that the, the young lions and you know, these other things, they were created in wisdom by God. It doesn't say that the, the, young, the lions were initially vegetarians and mm. later they become carnivores as a result of human sin, right? That, that is the young earth interpretation, but it is not supported, no, it is not <laughs> supported anywhere in the scripture, right? Rather, the Bible says that young lions, they were created in this way in wisdom by God. And so, um, and so this implies that there's already animal death, right? Before human death, okay? Uh, so, um, and, and this is also the traditional interpretation of when we look at uh, the history of, of, of Christian thought. No, for example, in Augustine, in Aquinas, no, uh, they mentioned clearly that uh, animals were already eating meat right, before human sin. And, and so the Yao creationist interpretation is also against um, the theological tradition as well. Thank you, Andrew. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's clear. I, I appreciate that. Uh, one more question, and I mean, you've, you can speak for hours on this too, but we'll have to limit ourselves. <laughs> so in, in just a couple minutes, um, so obviously the the issue of adam is another issue that people bring up with old earth and especially if you hold to an evolutionary view um so is adam unique um was there a real adam i mean again in a couple of minutes can you can you just summarize your view on that yeah it is perfect it is perfectly compatible with the affirmation of old earth to hold that there is a literal adam right that adam exists as a as a real historical person and it's also interesting to note that you know, um, Adam doesn't have to be someone living very long time ago. You know, he, he could be fairly recent as well, right? Why? Because scientists have calculated that it doesn't take a long time for one individual to be the common ancestor of every human being today. It will just take a few thousand years right, for, for that to happen. And so Adam could be a real individual that just lived a few thousand years ago. Now, is that in conflict with what modern science discovered about hominids, which live way before that? Now, to answer this question, we also need to think about what does the Bible mean by human beings? So the Bible doesn't define human beings anatomically, but rather it defines human beings by the image of God, right? That's what human means. And so in Genesis chapter 1, it says that God created humans in the image of God. And so what image of God means is that humans can represent God to rule and subdue the world, 
um, they can be responsible. They can be aware that there's a God to worship God and to, re to, be re to be responsible to God for how they govern the world. And in the New Testament, when it talks about image of God, it indicates that you know, human beings have the capacity to become like Jesus, right? to be, become Christ-like. Um, so, so this is what the image of God means. And we need to understand that you know, this is actually referring to the spiritual, the moral, the functional characteristics rather than anatomical characteristics, right? And so now when scientists look at um, okay. the record concerning the, um, the hominid, those creatures um, in, 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 the much, in the much earlier period, the, those creatures are very different behaviorally, morally compared to us. So, for example, we, we know that writing, for example, right? Um, hmm. we, we know that we can write, and uh, the writing record on, on, only exists a few thousand years, uh, only began a few thousand years ago, right? Um, the Neanderthals, they are not able to write. So, behaviorally, you know, they are very different from us. You know, they have very different capacities, very different functions. And so, um, we need to, so and, and therefore, we need to distinguish between the functional understanding of humans versus the anatomical understanding, right? And what the Bible emphasizes is the functional aspect okay. uh, or, and the, the spiritual, the moral aspect. And that could have just begun just very recently. So what I'm saying is that um, it is perfectly con compatible with what the Bible is saying to think that as the Roman Catholic Church, you know, they, they hold to this view that um, our human bodies could have come from earlier uh, <coughs> hominid species uh, through uh, a natural process, but our souls our souls are immediately created by God in his image. Okay? So what this means is that God could have specially created Adam hmm. just a few okay. thousand years ago, right? On, on a, a, yeah, and so that doesn't exclude okay. the possibility that you know, our bodies could have, ex you know, the, the, the bodies that, uh, that uh, the hominid species could have existed way before that, right? But those are not theologically human, right? Because you know, they don't have the capacity or function um, uh, to represent God uh, in, in line with the image of God. So, so I think these distinctions are helpful, and this can help us to address, okay. um, to show how what science shows is in fact, uh, again, uh, there's no conflict with what the Bible says. Uh, once we understand the Bible, once we understand the Bible carefully, uh, uh, no, there's there's no conflict with science at all. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I I appreciate uh, hearing from you, and I, it's helpful to hear your view and and just that last summary too of of there's no conflict in your opinion between. The, the science that we have today and, and the biblical accounts uh, when we interpret both correctly. Um, so that, that's, that's very helpful. And I appreciate your emphasis as well on, on the fact that, okay, there are, there are some things in Genesis that we can know for sure, such as God, God created the world, uh, that, that Adam was, was unique, and that, that sin uh, is, is a result of, of something that Adam uh, did, that there's a certain action involved. Um, and and those are certainly weighty issues to think about too, with with death and and how that that comes in. And um, you know, I've, I've appreciated recently studying Augustine and, and realizing that you know even before Darwin, people were thinking yeah. about some of these weighty issues as well, and, and how those things of uh, you know what that means. Um, so that, that that's encouraging to me at least that the great men and women of the past have thought about this too, and, and have have at times uh, been unsure of, of how to exactly what to say or. Um, well, God is infinite and we are not, so we certainly can't know everything about him. Um, uh, but certainly we, we can acknowledge that creation does uh, give, give testimony to him and, and declare of his greatness uh, and his glory. And so I think it's, it's important for Christians to, to be able to interact with